to staying the course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised Word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. I love your word. I love the way. In 1 Corinthians, you don't need to turn there, chapter 11, uh, Paul reminds the Corinthians who had, uh, so to speak, one foot in the world and one foot in Christianity. They were, in many ways, they were half-hearted Christians, and that's the way in which they celebrated communion. So Paul writes to them a cautionary note. He says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord is in an unworthy manner. That's what they were doing. They came there for a meal, not to worship the Lord. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man or woman must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. And so Paul is calling for a healthy introspection here uh, from the folks that are about to receive communion. And that's what I'm asking of you, some healthy introspection. And if you need to reconcile your heart before the Lord, if you need to confess any sin, now would be the time to do that. Are, are you a people of prayer? Do you connect with God every day? I mean, we should not only just pray in the morning or pray before meals or pray before we go to bed, but we should consistently throughout the day pray. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Pastors, believe it or not, are issued by God himself a direct communication device to the throne. Did, did you know that? That's why you always call me to pray for you and, you know, hey, uh, Lord, how you doing? No, the, the interesting thing is we don't need one of these to connect with God. Every one of us here has direct access to the throne of God through Jesus Christ. Do you know that? That when you pray, he hears your prayers and it makes a difference. Folks, God is looking for people to be a people of prayer, to connect with God. If, if, if you have a hard time praying, I would encourage you, try a fast. Have you ever done that? You know, your whole body, I don't know about you, but my toes, I can hear them yelling out softly, feed us, feed us. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's really a good spiritual exercise. So with that, our journey continues. We're going through the whole Bible. We made it to Exodus chapter 6, and today's entitlement of the message would be Prophecy and Promises from Fear to Faith. You know, God has given us a lot of promises in his word, hasn't he? But what we've discovered so far in the book of Exodus is Moses was a man of fear and doubt. So far, he was not a great leader. He wasn't a great godly man. In fact, we're going to find out some interesting things about Moses. So in our text, you can turn there, uh, Exodus chapter 6, starting at verse 10. And we have a very unique thing in this chapter. We have a genealogy that should have been at the beginning of the book of Exodus, but for some reason it's like a parenthetical in this chapter, Exodus chapter 6, and we made it to verse 10, and it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses. He probably had one of these radios like this one up here with direct access to God. Go tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel out of the land. But Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. I'm kind of feeding back a little bit, Alex. I think, at least from up here I am. Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am what? What does he say? Unskilled in speech. Do you know Moses has given a lot of excuses why not to be used by God? We're going to go over those again today. Verse 13, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them a charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. Skip down to verse 28. Now it came about on the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord. Remember all caps? What does that mean? Yahweh, that's uh, the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. So when you see Lord in your Bible with all capitals, sometimes the L is bigger than the rest, but they're still all capitals. That is God, God the Father's sacred name. Yahweh is probably the best translation and pronunciation of that. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am Yahweh. 
Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. But Moses said before the Lord, and again he makes an excuse, Behold, I am unskilled in speech. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? And what we skipped was a genealogy. And uh, we're going to get into that a little bit, the genealogy. And I believe the genealogy is there to encourage Moses. You see, Moses had doubt. He had fear. He's like, man, I tried to go to Pharaoh. I did what you told me to do, God. And Pharaoh rejected your word. More than that, he put this heavy burden on the whole nation of Israel. Now they have to make bricks, we found out, without straw. Now the cool thing is in archaeology, we found that dig where they had bricks made of straw and then on the upper levels, all of a sudden there's bricks without straw. I mean, archaeological proof that the word of God is true. I love that. Man, we went through that in depth. But this genealogy really is telling Moses, listen, you are a descendant of Levi. You are a rightful leader to the nation of Israel. You need to do what I've called you to do. God begins with the firstborn of Jacob, or his name was changed to Israel, to demonstrate that Moses is a descendant of Levi. And remember, all the priests came from the tribe of Levi, who was the third son of Jacob. Reuben was the first, and Simeon the second, and Levi the third. And that's from Genesis 29, 31 through 35. And we know all three of these men were great, mighty men of God, correct? No, they made mistakes. What did Reuben do? He slept with his mother, his uh, uh, stepmother, (laughs) you know, right on Moses' couch. I mean, what in the world? These guys were not great, mighty men of God. They were sinners, yet God used them anyway. Why? Because eventually they truly repented of their sin. You know, it seems in the Bible, if you've ever studied all the characters and people that God used, it seems like they're all pretty much sinful, sinful people. People that didn't have a lot of talents, like Moses. Man, I can't even speak. Some theorize he had a speech impediment, yet God used him as a spokesman for him. Let me tell you this. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. No matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, no matter where you find yourself in life, when you surrender to Jesus Christ, you become an ambassador of his kingdom. Do you walk through life like an ambassador? Do you try to witness to everyone you can? Well, wait a minute, Pastor, I'm of unskilled speech. Oh yeah, that's Moses' excuse. Yet God used him powerfully. Moses was a descendant of Amram and Jochebed, the woman. Again, Jochebed was the sister of Kohath, Amram's father. So Amram married his father's sister. What in the world is going on? I mean, why is this junk in the Bible? You see, I believe what it does is say, even when we make mistakes and we feel unworthy, God loves us and can change a bad situation into good. He can turn ashes into beauty. I know he's done that in my life. And if you've been a believer for any length of time, you know he's done it in yours. Moses was the second born son of Amram, who was the first born of Koath, who was the second born of Levi. I'm just going through the whole genealogy like this instead of just reading it. Who was the son of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, obviously, who was the sons of Joseph in Egypt because of the famine in the land of Canaan. Some key players mentioned here, Korah, you guys remember him. What did Korah do later on in the book of Exodus? Uh, uh, What did he do? Do you remember? He led a rebellion against Moses. What happened to Korah and all the people that rebelled against Moses' leadership? They were swallowed up. They were destroyed. You see, God establishes a hierarchy that needs to be, uh, we need to obey. Uh, Nabod and Abohu, Exodus 6.23, were slain by Yahweh, Jehovah, for their presumption in offering strange fire on the altar in Numbers 3.4. Remember those guys? Yeah, they offered strange fire on the altar and God slew them. They were horrible priests. Eliezer and Ithamar ministered in the office of high priest. Eliezer succeeded Aaron to the office in Numbers chapter 3, verse 4. They're in this genealogy as well. According to their host, Exodus chapter 6, verse 26. 
Uh, does your Bible say that? What, what does the NIV they say? Exodus 6.26. Yeah, just the uh, first part. Yeah, oh, by their divisions, okay. Uh, King James, who, who has that? It says by their armies, uh, by their host. That's kind of the word in the, in the Hebrew. And the interesting thing is they will become armies. They will fight to regain the promised land that God had promised to them. And it's just interesting, it's the first time it's really mentioned in Scripture that Israel began to organize in the 12 tribes according to their host, or armies, some insights on the genealogy. God's chosen people are those that follow him, not just those who are born Jewish. Do you know that? In fact, Paul in Romans says, not everyone who is a descendant of Israel or Abraham is Abraham's or heirs according to the promise, but those who what? Have faith. So we become that. It's really interesting. Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman, that's in the a genealogy we find in our text, Exodus chapter 6, verse 15b. Do you know that in the Lord's genealogy, there's several Gentile people mentioned? You know, even Joseph married an Egyptian woman. You see, some people say, how could God just choose the Israelites to save and all the Gentile nations are going to burn in hell? Is that what the Bible really says? Oh, no. Anyone who chooses to follow God becomes his people of any nation. Romans chapter 2, verse 9, it says, There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also the Greek. Verse 10, But glory, honor, and peace, don't you love that? To everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Acts even says it clear. I love this statement, Acts 10, 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. And we talked about that in depth a few weeks ago. But in every nation around the whole world, the man or woman or young person who fears God and does what is right is welcome to him. So even in this genealogy, when we find a Canaanite woman in the genealogy, we understand that even back then, God was open and graceful to anyone who would come. Another point, the second detail is Moses and Aaron came out of a relationship that was sexually forbidden by God in later times. In fact, in Leviticus 18, 12, it says, do not have sexual relations with your father's wife or sister. She is your father's close relative, and yet we know that Abraham's father did this very thing. What we learn from that is despite our sin, when we repent, God still forgives and loves. Aren't you glad about that? No matter how we fail God. Abraham married his father's sister and bore Aaron and Joseph. Salvation comes to sinners and frees us from the past and opens up a glorious future. This morning, I don't care what you've done. As we took communion, we remember that Christ paid for that sin on the cross of Calvary and that we are cleansed and forgiven and that God will use all the horrible circumstances in our lives to bring us into something good. Jesus promised, just like to sinners like us in John chapter 14, says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Oh, he will even do greater things than these because I am going to the Father. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. Aren't you glad to be a friend of God? For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Exodus six seventeen through 20. This genealogy isn't comprehensive. In fact, some people are left out of the genealogy. The purpose is, is to connect Moses and Aaron to Levi. That's why the genealogy is there in uh, Exodus chapter 6. God establishes also in this genealogy a hierarchy. The Levites now are the ones that actually rule the nation of Israel. Later on, we will find judges will rule, and after that, the nation will demand what? A king. And the Lord says, man, I want to be your king. But man, if you want a physical king, a man, oh, you'll get one 
and you'll find out that it's not as great as it's purported to be. When we talked about the genealogies in Genesis, uh, Missler and others came up with this great coded message and the meaning of their names. But it's interesting from Levi to Moses and then a few more that the message is, when you look at the Hebrew meaning, Levi then joins himself. Well, you can go back to Jacob, uh, Levi's dad. A mighty prince sees God then joins himself to an assembly, a glorious people. Moses is, literally means to be uh, rescued out of the water, to be snatched out of the water. He rescued strangers in a strange land and captives delivered by God. Do you think God was trying to tell Moses even a message in the genealogy? I believe the reason the genealogy is here because Moses was still saying, I'm not the guy. I can't talk. You've got the wrong guy to lead your people the nation of Israel, out of captivity, out of Egypt. But back to our text, Levi lived 137 years in that genealogy. Kohath lived 133 years. Amram lived 137 years. And now we find Moses is 80 years old when he's going to go to Pharaoh. The prophecy literally back in Genesis chapter 15, when God told Abraham that his descendants would be in captivity for 400 years is now fulfilled, yet it's really interesting because in Exodus it says 430 years they lived in the land of Egypt. But remember, they moved there, Israel, for 30 years they prospered, and then they began to be enslaved for 400 years. Does that make sense? Okay. Moses and Aaron are Levites and literally rightful rulers of the nation of Israel as God's representative. So even though Moses doubts God, the genealogy says, listen, you're part of the ruling Levite class that I've called to lead my people. Has God ever called you to do something that you felt ill-equipped to do? Fact of the matter is, everything God asked me to do, I'm like, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> you know, when I was called in the ministry, Back in 1981, I know, I'm old. <laughs> 1981, and I was scared to death to get in front of people. Any of you have a fear of public speaking? Okay, even in class, when the teacher would call on me, I would sweat, I would shake, I would get a twitch in my cheek. I, w I would, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's your name? B b b b b b you know, I was scared to death. And when I was called, it was a supernatural call. But in the midst of it, I had a conversation with God. And I said, God, I can't public speak. I'm too wild and crazy. You've got the wrong guy. I like to race motocross. I like to do these things. I hate getting up in public. Lord, look at all the preachers around here. They speak in King James English and wear three-piece suits with a gold pocket watch. That's the only pastors I knew growing up. I'm, I can't be one of those guys. And I gave God 10 reasons why I couldn't be a pastor. And God uh, answered all 10 of the reasons in this youth rally I was to the speaker up front. And I knew undeniably that I was called. The, the fact of the matter is, if this church needed a worship leader, which we do, could be someone in this room right now. God has been prompting, man, you need to learn guitar. You know, Jake, big Jake, they all moved to Texas. Our whole worship team, by the way, the whole team moved to Texas. <laughs> it's kind of funny. You know, Jake came up to me soon after he came to the Lord in our church. Big pile driver, big guy, you know, rough. He goes, hey, man, God put it on my heart to be a worship leader. And I'm like, oh, my Lord, have mercy. Can you sing? <laughs> you know, uh, can you play guitar? And he goes, well, no. And I go, okay, learn guitar. Get a song ready, and when you're ready, come back. And uh, so I'm praying, and man, Jake came back, and he sounds awesome. I mean, God raised him up. Could be that you or someone you know is meant to be the worship leader here at Living Water. Could be that God's going to call you to do, hey, man, pick up a guitar. There's a spare one right there. If you need one, you can practice on it. Yeah. Scott, are you going to? No? I guess <laughs> Scott's like, why'd you call me out? Exodus chapter 6 10 through 30, Moses again in our text says what? I am a man of unskilled speech. You've got the wrong guy. 
There's no way I can lead a nation out of the land of Egypt. The prophecy, why don't we turn there, was Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. And all the way back in Genesis, God prophesied regarding the descendants of Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, it says, God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. And we know that to the very day when Israel left Egypt, it was 400 years exactly that they were enslaved in Egypt. The prophecy, the promise was made to uh, Moses time and time again. Exodus 12:40 says it was 430 years in total that they were in Egypt. Remember, 30 years of prosperity uh, when um, Jacob first moved there, and then the 400 years of slavery started. The promise began in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. We went over this clearly, that God told Moses, man, I'm going to deliver my people from the the uh, Pharaoh from the land of Egypt. I'm going to use you as the spokesman to deliver my message to Pharaoh. Yet he won't listen until I, with a strong arm, do what? Send plagues against the land. And finally, he will let my people go. But in the text this morning, Moses didn't believe the prophecy nor the promise. You know, a lot of things were prophesied in the Bible about the end times. Have you ever studied eschatology, the study of the end times? You know, a lot of the events occurring in the world today line up with Scripture. The geopolitical environment of the world, Russia sending troops to Syria in that alliance with Iran as another one, and Turkey will join into that eventually. That's Ezekiel 38, the Gog-Magog alliance. Folks, we can see these things and alliances begin to take place all over the world. God gave us prophecy to let us know, man, in the last days, difficult times will come, Paul wrote Timothy. In the last days, yes, we're going to see difficult times. Men will be lovers of self, boastful, arrogant, rebellious, disobedient, unloving, ungrateful. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness but denying the power. You see, I believe since God revealed what would happen, man, to that remnant bride of Christ, we need to shine brighter rather than look around at the world and say, woe is me. I know there's a big convergence coming up in September 23rd. Have you read anything about the conspiracy theories? You know, the great uh, proton accelerator and... CERN, Switzerland, and some are afraid a black hole is going to happen. And, but we already know that the world's not destroyed by a black hole. We, we know exactly what's going to happen. So we remember the prophecies and the promises, and we take courage in those. Does that make sense? You see, God is trying to get Moses in our text to remember, man, I prophesied you were going to be enslaved for 400 years. Man, the time is up. You, Moses, need to go and talk to Pharaoh to set my people free. It's interesting that God has a special purpose for every one of you in this room. That there's somebody that you are going to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ to that's going to change the course of their life. Don't be afraid like Moses. Don't make the excuses that Moses did. The prophecies and promises of God are clear. So the question is, do you really trust God? Moses didn't. But do you trust God with your life? With the challenges of life? Or do you always take things into your own hands? God is looking for a people that trust him. God repeatedly told Moses over and over, and I'll just paraphrase the multiple times that he told him so far in the book of Exodus. Man, Moses, I'm going to use you to speak to Pharaoh so that Pharaoh will let my people go and take you and all my children of Israel to the land that I promised to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the promise. Moses doubted the prophecy. He repeatedly told God he couldn't do it, and many Christians do the same thing today. They doubt the prophecies and the promises of God. They feel like God's not part of their life. 
when they pray, they feel like it goes to empty ears. But I can assure you that God hears your prayers. That God desires you to run to him. And many Christians, just like Moses, say, I can't do it. You ever tell God that? Hey, we need a Sunday school teacher. Well, I can't do that. Hey, we need help Sunday morning to set up. Oh, I can't do that. Hey, we need Thursday night, you know, someone to help come early and prepare for dinner. I I can't do that. (laughs) That's why we pay the pastor. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting. I I love it after church. I I literally, when everyone leaves, I pray and I uh, clean up. So when the janitor comes tomorrow morning, he's blessed rather than cursed. Does that make sense? Because we're so blessed to rent this little space Uh, from Rick Warren, I want to be a blessing rather than a burden, if that makes sense. And by the way, if you're wondering, our air conditioner is broken. So tomorrow morning, the air conditioner guy is coming out to fix it. I know last week, everyone tried to fix it. John and Ross were up on the roof and, you know, flicking breakers. Alex, you got to show me where the key is to that breaker box. Um, And so uh, anyway, it's still broken. So next week, we're going to have cool, fresh air. Isn't that going to be awesome? Hallelujah. I love that. What excuses do you give God? Let's go over the excuses of Moses again. Who am I? Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. God said, man, I'm going to use you powerfully to let my people go from Egypt and from Pharaoh. And Moses said, who am I that you would use me? You ever done that to God? Hey, man, I'm going to keep doing this sin. I'm not going to do this thing that I feel prompted that I should be doing for the church or in the church because who am I? I'm nothing. I can't do it. Exodus 3.13, Moses said, what shall I say? Hey, even if I go, what, what am I to say? I don't know what to do. Exodus 4, chapter 1, he says, suppose they will not believe me. And that's when God, for the first time in in the Bible, revealed his name. Remember that? Man, he says, who shall I say is sending me? And he says, you tell him. Oh, man, that Yahweh sent. That's my name. Oh, it's so cool. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue, Exodus 4.10. And in our text this morning, I'm of unskilled speech. But ultimately, Moses said in Exodus 4.13, You know what? Send someone else. I don't want to do it. Ultimately, it came down to Moses not wanting to do what God has called him to do. You know, men, God has called you to love your wives if you're married and lay down your life for her as Christ loves the church. Are you doing that? Well, I can't do it. I'm German. I'm hot blooded. (laughs) I'm Italian. You know, it's not my fault I yell and scream and lose my temper. God calls you to serve your family, mighty men of God, not to be served. If you're married, men, are you loving your kids? Are you discipling your kids? Are you reading the word and washing your wives and your kids with the word? And I'm not talking about sitting down for two hours and making your kids sit there and doing a huge Bible study. I'm talking about men, get up in the morning right? First thing you do, you should pray. Second thing, go get your coffee. That's really important. (laughs) If you drink coffee or hot chocolate, you know us. Third thing, sit down with your Bible. Get up early. Would you do this? And, And read to find a verse to share with your children and your wife. Just one verse, one nugget that you can say, man, during my devotions this morning, by the way, hey, son, daughter, bride, I prayed for you. I got up early before I went to work and I prayed for you. I love you. And as I was reading this verse, man, I just had to share it with you. Just one verse. Can you do that? Can you wash your wives and your kids, men, with the word of God and lead your family? You know, it will do great things in your marriage. Your kids will rise up and say, what what an awesome dad I have. Wives, man, can you love your husbands? Can you just respond? And even if they forget in the morning to pray with you or share a verse with you, could you say, 
hey, you know what? I was reading this morning, and can I share a verse with you? Wives, take the lead if your husband won't. They'll get the clue. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I forgot. Man, the pastor told me Sunday I should be sharing a verse with my wife and my kids. Hey, kids, if your parents forget, when you're reading the Bible, find a verse and text it to them. Hey, this morning I was reading, Mom and Dad. Check it out. Woo, this is awesome. And then your parents are going to be like, oh, man, our, our children have taken the lead of our family. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? You young people, man, take the lead if your parents don't. Ultimately, we are called to wash one another with what? The word of God. There's something incredible that happens spiritually when a man takes the lead. And Moses is about to do that. Next week, we're going to find Moses no longer gives excuses. Oh, man, Moses is going to become one of the greatest leaders the world has ever seen. He's going to become a mighty man of God. But we need to do that with our kids do you remember the first time God got angry in the Bible? Think about it. Oh, okay, let, let's try this. Okay, God created heavens and the earth. It was all good. Adam and Eve in the garden, and they sinned. And God burned in anger against Adam and Eve, right? No. No, he was grieved. He's like, oh, I, how could you do this? And he was grieved. So then they multiply, and, and let's flash forward to the flood. Man, all intentions of the heart, what does the Bible say? Were continually evil. The whole human race had become an evil multitude, and God became angry and destroyed him with a flood, right? No. No, the Bible says God grieved over the world, how mankind could have gone so far from the path, this beautiful world that God had created for us to enjoy and look at and go out and explore and, and see the beauty and give God glory as the divine architect of this entire ecosystem. Yet man failed and, is, and God grieved. He didn't become angry through all the sin of Genesis. And folks, there was a lot of sin in Genesis. Adultery, incest, harlotry, I mean, you name it, drunkenness. Through all of that sin, God never became angry. The first time God became angry in the Bible, Exodus chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. And here's why. But he, Moses, said, Please, Lord, send someone else with your message. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. He wasn't mad at anyone else. The whole book of Genesis. But man, he got mad at Moses. Why do you think? Because God spoke to Moses. In fact, the Bible says he spoke to him like a man speaks to another man face to face. God called him. God needed Moses to talk to Pharaoh so that his people could be released from bondage and slavery. And Moses refused to do it. And God's anger burned against Moses. Think about it. All the times in Genesis, God's anger never burned. And still to this day, Moses in our text this morning doubted God. The question this morning is, where do you doubt God? Is it with your job? Is it with your spouse? Is it with your kids? Even if your kids are away from the Lord this morning, man, trust God. Trust that God is going to bring them back. Pray the prayer of faith. Demonstrate Christ's love to them. Text them a verse. Tell them you're praying for them. Don't you like that God says it's my kindness that leads you to repentance? I think we sing a song like that, right? It's your kindness that leads us to repentance, O oh Lord, knowing that you love me no matter what I do makes me want to love you too. Lord, it makes me want to do beyond what I physically or mentally or emotionally feel that I can do. I'm going to do all that you've called me to do. I'm going to love my spouse even when they're unlovable. I'm going to love my children even when they're rebellious. You children, you young people, I'm going to love my parents even when they're unreasonable. You ever feel like your parents are unreasonable? Don't raise your hand. 
I'm looking at all the single people in here. <laughs> Talk to me later. We'll have family counseling. So Moses gave all these excuses. Who am I? Romans says in eight chap, at chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say? Man, if God is for us, what? Who can be against us? I don't care what is happening in the world today. This world is not my home. You know the bumper sticker thing, not of this world? Man, I'm just passing through. I am an ambassador of God's heavenly kingdom to a dark and horrible world. Man, things may get bad, but Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 is very clear. I can do some things. No, all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whatever challenge you're facing this morning, run to the Lord. We are going to find next chapter, Exodus chapter 7, that Moses finally is going to believe God and become the leader that God called him to be. And he's going to become that mighty man of God, this stuttering, weak, mamby, pamby, wimp of a man called Moses, by the power of God, will become a great leader. Folks, God has a purpose for your life. He's looking for people that will just include him and pray and lead where God has called him to lead. Man, through the gospel, Joe, why don't you come on up? 2 Thessalonians 2.14, while he's coming up, says, He's called you through his gospel, the good news, that you might share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, God wants to engage you. Comforts me, strengthens and restores my soul, satisfies my need. Thank you for listening to Staying the Course with Pastor Brett Peterson. If you would like a copy of this message or would like to submit a prayer request or comment, contact us at 949-888-5777 or email us at info at ccbcu.edu. God bless you as you seek and serve Him. Remember, stay the course, and we'll see you next week. I love your word, I love the way it comforts me, strengthens and restores my soul, satisfies my needs.